from the start, I mean, did you audition straight off for Reginald Cousins, a.k.a. Bubbles, or did you go for another part first? Uh, no, for me, you know, it was, it was, that was the, I got a call from my manager at the time in New York. I was doing a, a lot of theater in the off-Broadway uh, circuit, and I was quite happy with that. I thought that was, you know, my I thought my journey or my path was going to be off-Broadway, maybe Broadway, but sticking to that realm. And then my manager called and said, oh, they, uh, there's, a, there's a show on HBO called The Wire, and they want you to audition. And, I, you know, I got excited because at that time, all I knew was that HBO was the only channel that all of us were watching, but we loved Sopranos and uh, Six Feet Under, and it just felt like it was uh, taking television into a better form of uh, storytelling. So I got excited until she said, yeah, they want you to audition for a, a, a junkie character named Bubbles, and I damn near almost hung up on her, because I was like, I don't want to play a junkie. That's like a, you know, for me, that felt like a stereotypical kiss of death for a black actor in the States is uh, either a junkie or a homosexual because you know that you can automatically be pigeonholed in that, you know, in that box. So at first I said no, and then my manager reminded me about my bank account <laughs> and said that, you know, theater is not paying as much as you, you know, but the theater is not paying what you're spending. And as a manager, you owe me money. You know, so how about you go audition, you know, for the part, and if you book it, you know, then I want to hear you say no. But how about we try that? And I, I took that as a challenge from her. She was a great manager. I took it as a challenge. And, you know, I was really, you know, full of myself. And I was like, I'll, I'll, I'll book the motherfucker. Don't don't worry about that. I'll book it. I went in. And, I, you know, I didn't book it right away. I had like five auditions. And by the fourth audition, you know, all of a sudden, my ego was, you know, a little bruised. And I was like, I really want this part now. They're telling me I gotta go through all this fucking jumping through hoops. I want this part really bad. And then they called me and said, "Well, you're the, you're the, you're the top guy they like in New York, but now we gotta go to California and Atlanta and all these other places to find out." And I was like, you know, my mentor was like, "You know what? You can go wherever you want to go. I know that I'm the best man for this part. You know, I really did a lot of research and I did a lot of you know soul searching and and, and, and trying to find out." You know, what was behind, you know, the addiction, what was behind the person. And uh, after about five auditions and a lot of waiting and a lot of, uh, you know, Jack Daniels, and <laughs> you know, I got the phone call that I got the part. And it was it was a very exciting time. You know, my my lady at the time was like, you thought we were moving to California right then. And I was like, no, we're shooting in Baltimore. And, of course, she unpacked her bags right away and said, you know, good luck. Go do what you do. And when I got to Baltimore, you know, it was, a, it was a life-changing experience, both for me as a human and as an artist. So what did you think when you were first reading those those initial scripts and noticed this is not a normal hour-long police procedural drama? I mean, was you worried about that? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of us, you know, it was a two-stage type of uh, situation. You know, when I got the part, and we went out to Baltimore, and then, you know, we, when you read the pilot, you know, first I was just blown away because, you know, one, I got a job, so I was excited, and it's on HBO. And, you know, so you really look at the script that tight. It was just like, oh, shit, I got a job, I'm excited, I'm finally in a different level. And, you know, when, you, when the cast got together and we had the table read, you know, we couldn't help but notice around the whole table there was a lot of black characters, which is not the norm. For television, so that was exciting. There was a whole bunch of black actors. And we're like, we didn't. Nobody really knew it, know each other personally. Did we knew of each other? Nobody was like a superstar. Everybody was, you know, pretty much even keel on the come up with uh, respect. I mean, Dominic Dominic West has some success. Uh, Wendell Pierce, but all of us felt like we were on the same, on even par with each other. And there was no egos, and we was excited about the multi multicultural, you know, multicolored cast. And, you know, at the end of the table read, yeah, we all were like, well, this is going to suck. There's, no, there's nothing happening. There's a whole lot of talking. And, you know, uh, you know, most of us were nervous that it wouldn't be received well because the, the audience has been brainwashed to think that, uh, you know, uh, police procedurals end in an hour with the bad guy in cuffs. You know, or there's a lot of action, uh, you know, a lot of shoot 'em up like the shield, running and gunning and banging. Doors, 
And our pilot, our first two, three episodes, it was just a lot of talking and introducing of more and more and more and more and more characters. So, yeah, we thought it was going to be, you know, we shoot the pilot and then everybody goes back to looking for work. But not, it, most of us didn't think uh, it was going to get picked up after we shot the pilot. And then while we were doing it, a lot of us didn't think that it was uh, going to be a success because we just didn't think the audience was ready to sit down and just listen uh, instead of seeing action or seeing, you know, the normal good guy catches bad guy and puts him in jail and sleeps with everybody. I mean, talking of uh, Reginald Cousins, a.k.a. Bubbles, your character, I mean, th this guy is a consistent heartbreaker in everything he does. There's no way you can't feel for this guy. You know, he's trying to get out but consistently pull back in. Was it tough for you as an actor to go through these these demanding issues time and again with the same character? Yes, it was, uh, you know, uh, uh, everything about the character was tough. But like, like I said, you know, my ego carried me through as far as, you know, wanting the part. But once I got it and got to Baltimore, you know, unlike most television shows, you know, HBO was different and brand new at that time on the come up. And we had, you know, a more amount of time for research than we than you do uh, uh, normal television. So I, I got a chance to be in Baltimore for like about maybe a month. And also, and, and, and just, you know, do what I do as far as, you know, trying to study and break down a character. And I never, under, you know, I never had any dealings with, you know, that type of uh, addiction. You know, so I really, you know, got nervous, you know, when you, you know, I got, I got a chance to speak to a lot of people dealing with the addiction, um, past and present. And, you know, they all were different. They all had different stories. They all had different backgrounds. They all had different uh, effects. Uh, from the uh, heroin addiction, and you know, I it, it, it became my truth that I had to trust, uh, you know, my talents and trust that it's not about the, uh, not so much about the addiction that we're telling the story from. We're telling the story from the human being, and you got to have a lot of strength and confidence that you can go into playing any character and know that you don't have to do too much, but just be honest. And trust your fellow castmates. Trust your 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 your, your homework. Trust the, your director. Trust the writing. That everything is there for a reason, and everything is helping you, you know, embody this character. Um, and then while I was doing it, you know, by by the time midway through the first season, you know, I, I dropped in, you know, and I had moments where I didn't remember what I was doing. I was the character as much as I can be, and. You know, it, it was definitely mentally, you know, there's a lot of anguish. There was a lot of uh, depression. There was a lot of, uh, you know, a feeling of, of of loneliness and grief that I was, you know, embodying or taking on. And it was hard. And I had, like, mentors. Like, like I said, you know, my fellow castmates, my family, you know, you know, I was talking to them on the phone. Cause I pretty much stayed in Baltimore the first season. And I, I got to, you know, talk to my lady. You know, I had just I was just uh, just became a father, so at that time I was you know looking at pictures of my daughter, and it would help me, but it would also make me more sad because I understood that there was people out there going through this addiction, who were losing their family, who were losing their friends, who were losing a lot of things, and the idea that I might lose it all too, you know, became synonymous to, with playing the bubbles character. So it was it was hard work, and it was it was very trying and. You know, it's one of those, like, like I said, it was one of those characters and one of those experiences that, you know, made me a better person, you know, as a human and as my artistry. Yeah, I mean, you were saying there that obviously Bubbles is a, a drug addict through most of the show, but he cares. This is the thing. You you see yeah. relationships with uh, Sherrod and Johnny, and it shows a different side to him. I mean, is that the old Reginald coming through? Is that what he used to be? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, that's what he used to be, and that's what he still, yeah, again, that's what he still is, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, we've been desensitized, desensitized uh, with uh, mainstream television and movies where, you know, you feel like when when you become addicted, you turn into this monster that you, there's no there's no residue of, of your humanity, and it's it's still there. You know, and Reginald was a like you just like you just said. Reginald was a good guy. He was a good guy. He cared a lot. He had a, you know, he had a kid. He was he was with a lady, and he let the addiction get the best of him. And it might have uh, it might have you know, took over his life as far as the, the thirst and need to get high to escape the constant mistakes that he would make that he was making. But it didn't it didn't eradicate 
him as a human being. And he had it, you know, for him, caring and being purposeful was, you know, the thing, the thread that, you know, eventually helped him climb out of that hole. I mean, that's 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 what he was holding on to uh, to sustain himself from not going too dark or not going into, you know, a certain despair of giving up everything. You know, that, that caring for another, of your fellow man or that, you know, the idea that I, I serve a purpose, which was, you know, how it works so well with uh, uh, Kima and uh, McNulty was that, you know, he, he wanted to have a purpose. He, you know, he wanted to, you know, have a input in society and in his community. And those are the things that, you know, that kept him, you know, the light at the end of that tunnel, whether it dimmed, you know, it got low or high, it still was that light that said that you can, you know, get yourself out of this, out of the situation, but it can only be you. And, you know, and, I, and I think that's the, the term when they say you hit, you hit bottom. When you hit bottom, you know, everybody can try to help you, but you yourself is the only one that's going to be able to say, Let's put this foot forward and, 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 and keep walking and keeping it clean. Yeah, I mean, just and moving on from that, you got what you call your streak Oscar. Now, can you explain what happened there? Yeah, early, early in the, uh, in, the in the first season, you know, this was like, you know, like we spoke on before, this was, uh, you know, my for me, this was a big step and I, you know, I wanted to get it right and I had so many, so much pressure on, you know, not, making, you know, this character a character or one dimensional. So I would, you know, I would stay in, you know, I guess I would do what we now know, you know, like Daniel Day Lewis, uh, or Christian Bale, you know, I, I was trying to stay in character on and off set. So I would, you know, walk around, you know, in, in, in my bubbles wear and I would constantly be thinking about how to get high or, or where do I get money? And so that kind of played into my, my aura and I guess when I was walking uh, away from set, you know, some real um, addicts uh, who had just copped, uh, who copped uh, some uh, some drugs, some testers, uh, came by, saw me, and I guess felt like I needed a hit. <laughs> so he's like, "Yo, they're giving out free testers," and he gave me, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, free te- a little a little red cap of some heroin, one on one. And at first, when he took my hand, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know if he was just shaking my hand because he might have, you know, known me or known or thought he recognized me. It's when he walked away and when I opened my hand, I had this, uh, this drug in my hand. And I was like, wow. He thought I was, that's one junkie to the next. He thought I was the real thing. And I remember going to my trailer looking at it like, I'm on the right path. I'm doing, I, you know, I, my homework, my homework is working for me. And I felt really, really proud of it. And there was that, that one second where I was like, well, maybe if I take this, I will definitely get the Emmy of Cody <laughs> Grove. If I take this, they can't say this ain't real. But, you know, common sense kicked in, thank God. And I was, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're doing you know, you're acting on television, you, you got to do, you know, more than one take. And I knew if I took this drug, I'd be good for one take only. And so I said, you know what, let me just keep this here. And I kept it for all five seasons, and it reminded me when I had moments of uh, doubt or when I felt like I was getting burnt out or stressed out. You know, I would look at it as a reminder that you have to trust your homework, trust you, you know, trust who you are and your talents, and you'll get through every episode and every season. You know, by the fifth season, you know, I almost had moments of just being burnt out. And the fifth season was almost just as hard as the first season because it came like a year later when Bubbles was supposed to be clean. And after four years of being a junkie, I didn't know what that meant. And also, you know, it was just, you know, I, I would say, you know, with that writing and, and the, the right directors and, and my fellow castmates, making sure that we all took care of each other and kind of helped support every actor in their character, you know, achieve their arc. You know, it was the, it was the closest to theater that I've ever experienced and still, still search for. And you know that last that last season when I had that speech with uh, about Sarad, you know it was kind of a weird thing because I remember reading it on the script going, oh look at this big speech, how do I play this speech? How do I you know how do I you know sell this you know wonderful writing? And you know at the end of the day when I when I was in my trailer working out working out so many different ways of being very dramatic and how do I sell it? You know I looked over at that street Oscar. And I said, wait a minute, what are you doing? You ain't got to play it. You just got to be it. Like you've been all four years. 
And it really helped me walk out that trailer and onto that set, just trusting and just not worrying about anything else but just being, you know, Reginald. And that's, you know, that, that, that to this day was probably my finest, you know, internal moment of being an actor because it, it just felt like everything came to, you know, everything came to that one point of just, you know, trusting and, and knowing that I belong here and that I worked hard and, and that Bubbles worked hard and he's, he's ready, you know, to continue a journey from a different perspective in a, di- in a different place. Sure. I mean, you're talking about obviously people mistaking you and obviously you getting into that method acting as it were. Didn't Mark Wahlberg mistake you as well? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know what? You've got all the answers already. You could have wrote this. You could have wrote this <laughs> interview yourself. Yes. Uh, yeah. It was, you know, you know, by every HBO was big at that time and they would, throw, they would throw all these parties like for premieres, Sopranos premiere, Entourage premiere. They would throw these parties. And I remember early in the, in the Wire days, you know, because the Wire is still, you know, incredibly enough, uh, when we were shooting and we were airing, we weren't popular at all. And, you know, it was a very small audience. And, you know, we would be engulfed by the success of Sopranos and Sex and the City and Sixteen Under. You know, we never got nominated. We never got, you know, that big audience push that we have now. But, you know, as a t- you know I was very happily surpri- surprised, you know, by Mark Wahlberg because obviously he watched the show early on. And, you know, he, I was at, the, I was at the, uh, the buffet line getting free food at our HBO party. And he came up to me and I, I saw him coming and I was like, oh, look at this Mark, you know, it's Mark Wahlberg. That's a cool ass motherfucker. And he came up and he was kind of, you know, had this, you know, this brow of concern. And then, uh, you know, he came up and was like, hey, you know, you got a good job now. Don't fuck it up. You know, I want to make sure you take advantage of your opportunities in life. And he was talking to me, which is a blessing, you know, that shows his character. Because he really was trying to look out for me and make sure that, you know, I understood, you know, where I was. And, 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 and I had to remind him, I'm like, you know, you know, I'm an actor, right? That's, I'm not like a real heroin addict. And he was like, he was taking it back. He kind of felt a little embarrassed. But to his to his uh, credit, he was like, "Oh shit!" I mean, I I heard that David Simon and Ed Burns were you know casting real people too. I thought you were one of those real people they found in the street. And I was like, "Nah, motherfucker, <laughs> I'm from the Bronx. So, you know, I've been doing theater for a while." And he laughed it off, but he also gave me a pound like, "Yo, you're doing great work." So it was it was it was, it was you know it was uh, it was an exciting time. It was it was it was a great time, and you know I I, I thank Mark for that. Every time we see each other, we see each other you know at certain fight nights. And we give each other the head check and we, we give each other that little smile like, you know, he's happy to still see me working and I'm happy to see him where he's, you know, where he's grown. I mean, nobody saw him becoming this super producer that he's become. So it's, it's exciting to see where, where your art can take you if, you if you work hard enough. Yeah, absolutely. You were mentioned there, David Simon and Ed Burns, the writers. What was your relationship like with them? I mean, who gave you the most help on the character? Well, Ed Burns, uh, we had two writers, you know, two co-creators, David Simon and Ed Burns. And David Simon was the, you know, the head writer. And he was not really seen as much. He'd be in the room writing, you know, be in his office. Um, he was very rarely on set until we lost one of our producers, uh, Robert uh, Colesbury. Bob Colesbury had passed away. And that kind of forced David to come out and take his place and kind of interact with the actors uh, more than he would like to as a writer. And he was cool, but Ed Burns uh, was the ex-police, and Bubbles was his informant. So he knew Bubbles, and he you know he was the you know the one I would you know every once in a while after a scene look over, and if he gave me a head nod, I knew I was doing you know I was hitting the moments and hitting the hitting what they needed to be hit. You know he was that guy that you know was really really turned into you know a, a dear friend because you know the real Bubbles. You know, I don't know if you know this, but if I didn't, if I said no, like I thought I was going to say no, if I said no to playing this character, the character who played uh, Lieutenant Daniels, Lance Reddick, he would have been Bubbles. He auditioned for Bubbles, and they told him, there's one actor ahead of you that we like. If he says no, you're Bubbles, because the real Bubbles was like six-something tall dude and kind of, you know, had a different, you know, a different physical stature. And when I heard, when I found that out, you know, I was like, Ed, you know, how did I get the part then? And, you know, and, he, and they were like, 
you 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 had more of uh, bubbles of Reginald's essence, and it was something that you were doing with the character that we didn't see, you know, coming, which is part of that humanity that we were talking about earlier, you know. So that got me excited and got my mom mad. My mom was like, "What what, what they mean? My my son got the essence of a junkie. What the fuck does that mean?" And I was like, "No, nah, it's a good thing, Ma. I got the part." So you know, Ed Burns was the guy that I I would look to for you know that kind of wink that I, I was doing a good job. And, you know, and both of them, David Simon and Ed Burns, they, were, they, they, they really kept us all on our toes because when you talk to them, they were so invested and so, you know, uh, headstrong about what this story, you know, what this, this show was about and, and, and how we were, you know, speaking for, you know, a community that needed to be spoken about in, in a way that, you know, we needed to entertain but educate and enlighten people at the same time about what's going on. I mean, these guys really, really cared. You ask them about, you know, we would go up there and ask them, you know, like, what was this? Who won the football game? And that would turn into a three-hour conversation about how, you know, we're being distracted by television and bullshit when we're supposed to be caring about the community and doing something, you know, to improve our lives by improve, you know, by helping others. And it was, you know, I, 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 I don't think you will find any actor that was on this show that doesn't think that they've, they've been, you know, changed by, by these two men and, and, and that, and their portrayal are part of, of being on the show. You're talking there, obviously about Ed Burns, the, the infamous red hat scene. Now, is that based on real events? Did that happen to Ed Everything, Burns? I mean, Ed Burns, Ed Burns, not, not the actor, the writer, uh, Ed Burns, like I said, the ex cop, Bubbles was his informant, and everything that Bubbles did was something that, everything that I did, Bubbles did. I mean, Reginald Cousins, that's, the Red Hat's real, the, the fishing line, when I go, when I was, when I copped the, 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 the package out the tire, everything I, I did was, you know, officially a reenactment, so to speak, of what Bubbles was about. 98%, you know, of everything that was going on throughout the whole script was, you know, real life, uh, you know, real life events that were, you know, put together by Ed Burns and uh, David Simon. You know, you know, we, they were, everything that came out of our mouths was on the page. It wasn't that much ad living. I mean, these two guys really understood this story and these people. And, and, and you know, I might have gotten, I might have gotten away with one ad lib and that's, when I messed up and said being nutty. <laughs> when I said being nutty, I messed up and I was nervous. And David Simon, being the man that he is, and, and, and a testament to his his genius, is that you know he wants you to do it the way he wants it done. But if little gems come out of mistakes or come out of what you do, he wouldn't just erase it. He'll be like, okay, we'll keep that, but don't mess up no more lines. You know, like do something like that. But you know, these guys were, these guys were serious and they were focused, and, and they definitely were, you know, the leaders and the captains of the ship. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, they were, and obviously they're they're reporting back to HBO, as you were saying, who were on the cost. But and HBO sort of they they don't really care about viewers as such, and that that wasn't the next question. Was really that the hardcore fan base were already there from the beginning, from you know first season, but. To me, it didn't seem that most people outside of that hardcore fan base were picking it up until season four. Do you think people were scared of the show and what it was saying about society? I think people, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, a multitude of things, you know, and you, there's no one, you know, answer. We all have our, our theories. But at the end of the day, yes, there's a lot of things going on. I mean, at that time, at that time when we started shooting, you know, the first season, HBO was on a high. They didn't care about their audience. I mean, they didn't care about um, ratings, so to speak. But it was a big wave of Sopranos, Sex and the City, Six Feet Under. They were big, big shows, and especially Sopranos. So they understood what ratings, what kind of money and attention those ratings could, could be. And when they started giving a fuck about that and started saying, wow, this is really making our you know, our brand even bigger, you know, The Wire had was really filling a gap. You know, Oz was the first thing that gave HBO that kind of credible, it's not TV, it's HBO. That came from Oz and that whole prison story because nobody saw anything like that on television before. Oz would, had, had ended and, you know, 
between you and me and the viewers, you know, they needed black people on screen. <laughs> they didn't want to be hit. They didn't want to get hit with that diversity of okay, we have no black people. Like where's our? We need something for that audience. And the wires just seemed to you know like lightning in a bottle. Everything just you know fell into place. But on the same vein, you know, you're talking about a story or a structure like like we spoke about before. That's talking about a community and a destruction and despair. And a lot of people, you know, including my parents you know, who didn't watch the first couple of episodes because a lot of people don't want to come home after a hard day's work, after living that kind of life, not not to that extent, but just, you know, middle class, you know, or, or, or struggle, come home or turn the TV and watch that on TV. You want to watch something that, you know, like some sort of escape, some sort of like take me away from my world that I live at and take me somewhere else that I can laugh at or admire or, you know, the gangster, the, the mob story, we we grew up with that with the Godfather and Goodfellas. We we always found that intriguing, but you know a lot of people didn't want to come and turn on the TV and see those type of stories. You know it just it just made them feel worse. You know it made them feel like you know if it all, if it's all fucked up then why bother? So you know that you know that played into account. And then on the other side of color, yes, when you saw more than four black people on screen, you know a lot of people thought, oh, this must not be about me. <laughs> this is not my story, you know. This is not. It has nothing to do. I can't relate, you know. It's not until, you know, the fourth season did it just elevate to a different level of attention because it was, you know, it's about kids, and no matter what race, no matter what class you're at, rich, poor, black, white, yellow, green, everybody cares about their kids, or so everybody has an uh, an affinity or uh, an affection that they want kids to, you know, not be harmed. So it just took it to a it took it to a level where for the first time we weren't we weren't looked at as just a at its core a cop show. We were looking at it as as a as a as a show that's speaking about, you know, a community and what's happening to us in small towns like Detroit not small town, but like what's happening to our, you know, once, you know, flourishing towns like Detroit or St. Louis and Baltimore and what can be happening to your neighborhood or your city soon if we don't pay attention, if we don't start righting the wrongs. And, you know, that 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 came out a lot stronger or a lot more effective in the fourth season. And also, you know, the fourth season, you know, David Simon did something that he hadn't done before, or maybe HBO and David Simon. I don't know who what the who the mastermind was about that decision. But early in the first couple of seasons, you know, when you wanted reviews, you would send out like one or two episodes or three episodes to the press and what have you. And they would look at it and go and give their review. And a show like The Wire, you can't watch one or two episodes and get it or, or, or really feel it. You know, it's one of those unique shows that you don't even know you like it until you get to that last episode of that season. And then you go, oh, shit, that was great. But one or two episodes, you're like, wow, I don't know what's going on. There's too many people, you know. So with the fourth season, David Simon and them, they sent out all the episodes. So the review, the, the, the news people and the reviewers got to see everything. And when they watched all of that, they had a different outtake on what the wire was about, and they got it. And all of a sudden, the press was like, this is incredible. This show is magnificent. And, you know, we are a very, uh, you know, we're a very uh, influenced society. When they started reading that, people started going, oh, let me look at it. And when they looked at it, they said, oh, shit, I must have missed this. Let me go back. Let me go back and check out one, two, and three. And it just started this whole wave of, you know, early, early, you know, binge watching, I guess, back then. I mean, you know, the first binge watching I remember is the Twilight Zone Marathon every every uh, holiday. They just play back to back to back. That's the first one. Then the second one, I would give it to HBO when they just started doing HBO Go. I just came out. And people would come up to me and say, you know what, I watched, you know, HBO on demand. When people wanted to watch it, when they wanted to watch it, they want, they didn't want to be dictated. They wanted to make sure the kids were at bed. They wanted to make sure everybody, they wanted to get themselves settled in, and watch it. And that, that's that's what made the Wire successful. I mean, Sopranos and Sex and the City, they got the credit for being the whole uh, slogan "water cooler talk." Where you go, yo, you go to the job next day, and go, yo, did you see the episode last night? That was Sopranos. That was water cooler. But the wire, the wire wasn't water cooler talk. The wire became this. I watched the whole thing back to back and go around, and it became that conversation that that made you feel smarter about 
or made it was like a character. When you said I watch The Wire, you're saying I care about <laughs> I care about the community. I care about what's going on. I'm a, you know I'm that type of person. It became this whole different type of cultural effect that it was having on our viewers. That they felt like it was important to watch it. They felt like you know this was this was a this was a show that a lot of book readers and literature readers found it. You know, found it, I, I guess, uh, what's that word? Found it, uh, it gave us the credit. You know, if you're a novelist with like the, the Wire, that, that's one television show I would watch. Everything else is stupid, but I would watch it. You know, it, it had this air of you were super intelligent or you, you were super involved if you watched The Wire. And that's how it started catching on. I, I certainly for myself, I, I was kind of of the that binge watching. I mean, I'd never seen it. I bought the first season DVD box set and sat there. Yeah. And I, I, as you'd rightly pointed out, it takes a while to get into it. And I kind of noticed that actually, you know what? It's by I think episode six, you're you're into it then, and by then you're into everything that's going on, whether you understand, yeah. you know, the, the the slang terms or anything. By episode six, you get it, but you have to get yeah. to episode six, and you have to sit there and go through it all the way. There's no way The Wire would work one episode at a time. And that's obviously where it stumbled initially. So, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I, I think that's the thing that has brought people back to The Wire is that they can sit there and go, we're going to do three seasons in two days. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's crazy. I, you know, I'm amazed. You know, when I, you know, after season three, you know, we had gotten canceled. You know, HBO was like, you know, again, the numbers were not equal to what the numbers of Sopranos or Sex and the City or 16 under, it was like a big, big gap. And they were just weren't sure. They were like, you know, we just don't know if it's going to catch on the way we see the other ones are catching on. And three seasons is okay. And David Simon said, you know, I'm not doing the stream, I'm not doing the Boxdale storyline if, if I go to season four. And they were like, what do you mean? What do you mean you're not doing it? I mean, string of bells the sexiest thing. You know, they were, you're not, what do you mean you got to go back to the box? And he's like, no, I'm not doing that. I mean, I got, I got a different idea about the fourth season. And HBO you know, was like, you know what, then? We're going to cancel the show. We just feel like it's run its course. And they canceled the show. And we were all, you know, called up and let go. And I moved to L.A. And, you know, me, I, was, I think I was testing for my name was Earl at that time. And then I got a call from David Simon saying, yo, I gave them a couple of scripts of the fourth season, and they love it, you know. And when I was in California, nobody saw the show. Like no, I mean, I won't say nobody, but it wasn't. It wasn't like the East Coast where people were, you know, my neighborhood, you know, people was, had seen the show. In California, they were like, "What show is that? Oh, that's that. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, that's that. The Black Cops. Yeah, yeah. What, what character are you? Like it was. And then all of a sudden, four years later, or so or two, two, two or three years later, I go to somebody and like, and they say the same thing you say. You know, I just saw the wire. This is my second time. I've been watching it. I saw it all. I saw all five seasons in two days. I was like, that's crazy. <laughs> you ready to go in the corner and make some money. You know how it works. So it was, it's, it's, it's amazing what that, you know, that, I guess, ability to be able to watch it back to back to back or even the DVDs. When the, you know, that was, it was one point we were going to get canceled uh, in the, after the second season. But then the first season of DVDs came out, and that's where, again, you know, or HBO on demand came out, and that's where HBO started to get the numbers and and, and started seeing that there was an audience, you know, there for the wire, you know, and then you cut to like now, me and you talking. This is what we're talking about: ten years or eight years since the wire was over. You know, right now it's amazing that people talk about it, or it was amazing, you know, three years ago when I wasn't working at all when I was trying to find a way outside of the box of being a uh, junkie or being, you know, going to jail, coming out of jail or being in jail and had no money really in my pocket. But I looked at a magazine and it's saying that The Wire is one of the best shows ever. I mean, that's fucking, that's a, that's a mind, you know, for any artist, you know, respectfully, it's a mind fuck. You're like, wow, I'm so happy and it's an honor to be part of something that will go down in history as one of the best shows in that, ever. And I'm, you know, I'm looking for you know, I'm looking for changing the couch to try to get something to eat because I ain't been working in a while. So it, it was amazing. It's amazing that you know I could take my mom to the White House to meet the president because he loved the wire. But I never you know but none of us ever got nominated and never got into any of the Golden Globe or the SAG or the Emmy Awards. Like we just wanted to go. We didn't want to win. I mean, of course we did, but we were just mad that we couldn't even get in the room. We couldn't even get the swag bag. We couldn't even get the free champagne. You know, but you, you cut to now and. You know, our show is one of the shows that they're still talking about. I think it's a it's a testament to the times, to how people are responding to 
being connected. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's wonderful. You were just talking there about, uh, obviously, stuff you've done since The Wire, and I just want to sort of briefly talk on some of your work. I mean, I loved you in Super. I thought you were brilliant in Red Tails. Hellbenders, I laughed my ass off at it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, yeah. but, you know, the one film I do want to mention is Calloused Hands, which is a very tough subject about child abuse. I mean, how do you pr- approach an acting in a film like that? Well, you know, Callous Hands, again, I, you know, I, I think you saw, you know, I, I got on Twitter and stuff like that where, I mean, that's how I found Callous Hands. That was my introduction to social media. Uh, somebody on Twitter was like, yo, they're looking for you, uh, Andre Royal, there's a script. And I was like, what? And I looked on Twitter and I heard about Jesse Canones. And, you know, like I said on the Twitter back in the day, there's some there's some projects on, that pay bills and there's some projects that I'm proud of. I mean, Callous Hands was amazing. You know, I told you that, you know, during the wire, I had a daughter. Well, you know, I had a, a kid, and I was excited about being a father. And then all of a sudden, I meet this guy, uh, Jesse Quinones, and he, he's telling me, you know, I read the script, and, it was, you know, it was about parenting. For me, it was about parenting. And, you know, I, I was scared about the drugs. And, I, you know, I tried to talk Jesse out of having drugs at all. I was like, parenting and knowing how much to push and how much not to push is a story in itself. And I find that intriguing because we have the Serena Williams sisters, you have Tiger Woods, so you know pushing does work. But you also know with the Michael Jackson and all that, it can be detrimental. And what's too far? And nobody knows. Like, you got the Tiger moms that say you got to, you know, there's no fucking birthday parties, there's only practice. And then you got us over here in America going, that's not, that's not, you got to have a birthday party, you got to have, you know, some fun. It's childhood. So all those dynamics drove me, uh, drew me to Calipans. But then sitting with Jesse and knowing that this is his story, this is what he went through as a young man, and the bravery that I thought he had to put it on paper and to put it out there for the world to see and the world to judge. I mean, nobody wants to say, nobody wants to put their life on the screen and have somebody go, oh, that was whack, or oh, that's a stupid story. You know, oh, I've seen that before. I mean, you're, you're telling, you're, you're putting yourself out there to be judged about, you know, about your life. And I, I for, for me, it wasn't about anything else but, you know what? If you got the balls to write it and do it, and you think I can play the, your your stepfather uh, respectfully, then you know let's 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 go at it. But let's be let's be clear. This is gonna be therapy for both of us because I'm gonna tap into you know my own issues of being a parent and maybe certain times when I push too far. Like I, I, I'm sure all parents, you know, and I'm just talking about me. You know, push my daughter too far every once in a while when I thought that she could be successful in something. I'm the, I'm the dad that you know would get red card at the soccer field when I took off my shirt yelling and screaming. I made those mistakes. So I really wanted to address that and, 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 and have a therapy session on screen to, to uh, I guess, eradicate my own demons. And Jesse trusted me and I trusted him. And it became a labor of love for two guys who, who were just being honest about their, you know, their mistakes or their upbringing. And, you know, I did the same research I did with uh, Bubbles. I talked to a lot of, you know, abusive parents. I talked to a lot of parents who, you know, have prodigies. And I just was trying to find out what their mindset was. Well, what, what, what to them was too far or not too far. And with, as far as the addiction, you know, like I said, there's no part about, there's no part of, I mean, Bubbles is ingrained in me. I mean, he's a part of me. So the addiction, it was a little bit of a self-reflecting on, on what Bubbles went through. And, um, you know, it was, it was an amazing experience because it became, you know, it, it, Bird is a totally different character than Bubbles, but he's you know, the same thing that resonates uh, hopefully with all my characters is the human aspect, the human beings, they make mistakes. We're all multidimensional. And I like, I like to hopefully make sure all my characters, no matter who I play, has that I, you know, aspect where you see different sides of them. Yeah, I mean, I, I found it very powerful. I mean, completely moving, absolutely. You know, it's it's one of those films that I think only comes along every so often. Um, because, oh, thank you. Well, I think if if it come along too often, it would just it would just weaken the message. But you know, that film yeah. has got such a strong message that you can't get beyond it. I think that's the great thing about it. Um, oh, thank you, my man. Um, but yeah, moving on from that, something very emotional to something kind of carefree and fun, Agent Carter. 
<laughs> and you played Crime Lord Spider Raymond. I mean, what, what's it like in the Marvel Universe? The Marvel Universe is fantastic. I mean, I'm a, I'm a 40, 46 year old man. I used to wear underwears. I always wanted to be a superhero. So, you know, this is the Marvel Universe is. It's amazing, and it was a it was a, a favor. It was a cool idea. Um, I know um, the co-president of Marvel, uh, the Marvel Universe, uh, uh, Lou Esposito, and uh, he was a real. He, he directed a, a Item Forty Seven. That was his first directorial debut, one of the shorts, and he was doing uh, Agent Carter, and he's a Bronx boy. You know, and I'm a Bronx boy. So, and we met at Comic Con one time when another buddy of mine, Maximiliano Hernandez, who played um, when he plays uh, Jasper Jasper Sitwell in all the other Marvel uh, movies. So we all know each other. We all hanging out. And I get a phone call from Lewis, and he goes, "Hey, man, I got a character for you." I, you know, listen, he dies. Let's be clear. I don't want you getting too excited. But I, I want you to play it. I think you're a cool dude, and I want to, you know, dress you up. You know, I love you as Bubbles, and I want to dress you up fly, and I'm going to turn you into the Humphrey Bogart of my Marvel Universe. And I'm like, oh, shit, that sounds dope. And then I read the script, and I'm like, yes, okay, listen, I understand where you're going at with the whole cast of Ranger, but this ain't, this ain't Humphrey Bogart, because nobody kills Humphrey fucking Bogart. This is more Peter Lorre. You know, and I love Peter Laurie. And, you know, if you ever saw Casablanca, he was a big guy, you know, character actor that my dad used to be in love with and always show me his movies. And I was like, this is more Peter Laurie. And I'm okay with that. I got big eyes, too. And I could do, Rick, Rick, help me, Rick. I can, I, can, I can embody that kind of character. But it, I loved the way he pitched it to me at first. He said, you're going you know, to have the, the dinner white jacket. You're going to be the Humphrey Bogart. And I was like, all right, that sounds fantastic. And when I got there, um, you know, Agent Carter, Haley, She's a, a beautiful person, and I got to kiss her. That's fantastic. Uh, I think that was my first kiss scene on screen. I got to kiss a, a, a marble, a marble uh, heroine. So that's that was great too. So it was a, it was a lot of fun. I mean, anything in marble, that's the first that's the first word that comes out of anybody's mouth when they do a marble anything. It's fun. So that was fantastic. Well, you were talking about, you know, you were growing up with superheroes and stuff like that. So my next question is, what superhero would you want to be? Oh well, and, and, and me going when I was growing up, um, shit, that's that's way back. Well, my first superhero that I wanted to be, um, was Daredevil. I think Daredevil was the first one that stuck out to me because I just felt like, you know, the, the whole handicap and you know, there's no excuse. Like I was looking at myself like, there's no excuse for me not to be able to do anything. This blind motherfucker is doing everything, so there's no excuse for me not to do it. So Daredevil was my first, you know, comic book that I got caught up on. And then after that, you know, you're going to the New Mutants. Wolverine, of course, was the, the macho. Hulk was always great. Um, and then later on, Batman, the writer, when Frank Miller got into Batman, again, I, I was always attracted to the stories. Frank Miller was great uh, when he did with Batman. And then I guess as I got educated in, the, in my own literary world, Silver Surfer stood out to me because I found him so hard to understand. When I was reading Tony, when I was reading his comic books, I was like, I don't know what the fuck is going on. And I felt like I was being educated. And I was a huge silver surfer. Uh, I would try to talk like him uh, in my neighborhood in the Bronx, and I would get laughed at. But I also would get girls. So it worked out for me. Silver surfer worked out for me with the ladies. <laughs> Well, I mean, going back to The Wire, um, and the final question, mate, what are your best memories of the show? What what are you, you know, always going to remember? Well, that's, uh, you know, I would have to say uh, I will always remember um, Baltimore. I think Baltimore, you know, like coming from the Bronx, I had, I had an idea, a very little idea of what Baltimore was like. And when I got there, you know, there was so many things going on. I mean, Baltimore, I've never been in a city. I'm not, I'm not a well-traveled person, but I've never been into a, a place where when I first got out there, there was just a lack of, there was just a, a lack of hope. I mean, it was like nobody cared. It was like, there was like, who gives us this is the last stop? Who cares? And you kind of felt that, you know, amongst the community. Like, you know, you got rows and rows of boarded up houses. You got neighbors and neighborhoods full of like just, people were addicted junkies walking around and they walking right next to John Hopkins, you know, where you got doctors. And I was like, this is a crazy fucking town. It's like a twilight zone. But everybody was so honest. Like what you saw is what you got. And, you know, I just fell in love with the idea that we were telling that story. And then by the time the 
second and third season came out, you saw people starting to care. You saw people going like, you know, I saw my house on, 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 on your show, and I was embarrassed by the way it looked. And you saw people cleaning up, and then it felt like we were both teaching each other. Like, for me, they were teaching me how to, you know, find my character. And we were teaching them how to find their character or, or giving a fuck about your neighborhood. And it just, and like I said, it, it, it changed my life. So, I, you know, I, to this day, you know, I, I might run around and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm still trying to find those type of storytellers. I'm still trying to find those that, that camaraderie ship with my fellow actors, you know. And I'm still trying to find, you know, a place like Baltimore. And, I, you know, I think I'll find the first two before I ever find another place like Baltimore where I, you know, I can call that my second home. But, you know, just, 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 other than that, I can't say there's a specific scene or a specific director because, again, it was lightning in a bottle, and we all felt like we were growing up together, like like five years of college, and everybody, you know, we became a family. And, you know, I did those, 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 those times will never be forgotten. I might forget a line here and there. You know, I know everybody has quotes that they love, and everybody has certain scenes that they love. For me, the whole thing, like, it's just like watching The Wire. It's the whole thing. It's from the first episode to the last episode and how you grew and what you learned along the journey. And Baltimore was our biggest stage, you know, coming from bringing it all back to my artistry and all back to starting in theater. It felt like I was on the biggest stage on the fucking planet, and that's Baltimore.